morning, everyone, and welcome to the Mount Calvary Baptist Church of Stewart. We are located at 904 Southeast Bayou Avenue in Stewart, Florida, and we'd like to say thank you for joining us and welcome to our Sunday morning worship service. service. We are so glad that you've taken time to stop by our page, our Facebook page, our YouTube page, or someone invited you to a watch party. We're glad that you have joined us. We've got a message of hope for you. And the message is that Jesus is still alive. And because he is still alive, he is still in control. Don't you worry, don't you fret, don't you give up. Hang in there. God is in control. Here's what you need to know. That everything that you're going through in your life is covered under the blood. I said everything. I don't care what it is. Sickness. I don't care if it's financial trouble. I don't care if it's relational trouble. Here's what I need you to know. That everything that you're going through is covered under the blood. Let's pray this morning. Father God, we thank you. For we are covered under your blood. The blood that reaches to the highest mountain. The blood that flows down to the lowest valley. We are all covered by your blood. Thank you. And all of your greatness and all of your majesty and all of your splendor. You came down to earth as a humble servant. And gave yourself as a living sacrifice. Becoming the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. Because of the shedding of your blood, we have remission for our sins. And so if someone asks us, if, if someone wants to know how did we get through, how did we take it this far, how did we become saved? It's not in our own efforts, Lord. We can say that, oh, it is Jesus. It's Jesus down in our soul. And Father God, we thank you. Thank you that it is no but Jesus, when we've been in trouble, when we struggle, when we fall, when we get back up, we can say, oh, it is Jesus. And his blood has made us whole. Father God, we give you praise. We give you honor. We give you all the glory. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for cleansing us with your blood. Thank you that you have turned our lives around and now we are here to worship you and give you all the praise and we will testify on the mountain top we will testify in the valley low that all oh, it is Jesus thank you we give you praise amen Yes, it's 
is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Join us to see what the Veterans Health Administration's Intimate Partner Violence Assistance Program is doing to raise awareness about intimate partner violence in October 2020. Domestic Violence Awareness Month evolved from the Day of Unity in October 1981, observed by the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence. The intent was to connect advocates across the nation who were working to end violence 
Intimate partner violence is a type of domestic violence. It is a serious public health problem that affects millions of Americans. IPV is any violent behavior, including, but not limited to, physical or sexual violence, stalking, and psychological aggression or coercive acts by a current or former intimate partner. Intimate partner violence can vary in both frequency and severity, can occur in heterosexual or same-sex relationships, and does not require sexual intimacy or cohabitation. During the month of October, IPV Assistance Program Coordinators and Champions at every VA across the country collaborate with partners inside and outside of the VA to spread awareness about IPV and share resources to assist veterans, their partners, and VA employees who are impacted by the use or experience of IPV. The IPV Assistance Program encourages the importance of seeking assistance through a relationship check with this year's Domestic Violence Awareness Month theme, Check Up, Check In, Check Out Relationship Health and Safety. This theme emphasizes the importance of three separate pieces of a relationship check. A relationship checkup is an opportunity to seek assistance from your VA care team about relationship health and safety. During the relationship health and safety checkup, veterans are screened for the experience of intimate partner violence. A relationship checkup is an opportunity for education, prevention, and early intervention. Checkups allow for a pause to set goals and optimize health. Goals can include many activities to promote healthy relationships, such as expressing appreciation, clear communication, and conflict resolution. Unhealthy and dangerous relationship behaviors include the use of control, aggression, manipulation, and volatility. You may speak to an IPV assistance program coordinator or champion to assist you if your relationship is unhealthy or unsafe. Completing a relationship checkup can help one recognize the importance of developing a self-care or timeout plan for a stressful situation. The VA is a safe and confidential place to discuss any questions or concerns you may have. Relationship stress can lead to feeling isolated and alone. This can be an important reminder to reach out to friends, family, or your VA team. Whether you are currently in a healthy or unhealthy relationship, the VA is here to help with follow-up support and resources. Services include couples workshops to learn healthy communication skills and to manage stress, anger, and relationship conflict. Groups for veterans to learn more effective ways of managing stress and anger. Your local IFBAP coordinator can also help refer you to individual or couples therapy, complete safety planning, and connect you with community partners. On the VA Intimate Partner Violence Assistance Program website, you can check out resources and connect with the local IPV Assistance Program coordinator at your VA location. There is no better time than now to complete your relationship checkup with your VA care team. Election Day is Tuesday, November 3rd. Are you registered to vote? Go to www.vote.org to learn more about voter registration and voting locations near you. Your vote is your voice, and your voice is your power in our democracy. Be heard. Make sure you register and vote. Tithing is our opportunity to give the gift that keeps on giving. Please use Givelify, our convenient online giving app. All you have to do is tap, give, and you're done. If you're not using the technology yet, mail your contribution to our P.O. Box 1916, that's Stewart, Florida, 34995. Thank you. Virtual is how things are happening now. Be on the lookout for our virtual youth church. It's forthcoming. Although physical distancing is necessary and we are not yet back in our physical location, stay connected with us by phone, fax, email, website, or Facebook. Or my personal favorite, 
is on our YouTube channel, MTC904. Hope to see you there. Noonday Prayer is returning soon, virtually this time. Be on the lookout for it any day now. We're fired up on Tuesday nights. Join us every Tuesday night at 7 o'clock p.m. for Tuesday Night Live on Facebook or Periscope. Look forward to seeing you there. Schools are open all over, some virtually and some in person. Let us continue to pray for our students, teachers, and all workers that keep the schools open and running smoothly. Is the anniversary of the day you were born in October? If so, the Mount Calvary family wants to say happy birthday as you celebrate the years gone by. Enjoy your birthday. Courage, I Will Not Fear, is our October sermon series. We are defined by courage, which is God's plan for our lives. Please join us every Sunday in October and learn how to balance your life with courage. Would you please grab your Bibles and turn with me to a very familiar passage of song. 
the 23rd Psalm written by David. Many of you already have it earmarked in your Bible, that's on your coffee table or next to your, your bed. Some of you have it saved on your phone or tablet or electronic device. Some of you have it printed out and it's hanging on the wall somewhere. But today I want to share with you Psalm 23. Would you please stand where you are for the reading of God's Word, Psalm 23. If you have it, smile right where you are, if you have it. Yeah, I can see you smiling. Let us read the Word of God together. It's very familiar, and sometimes when it's so familiar with us, we forget the beauty of what this text says. So let's read it. Let's read it. David wrote these words in Psalm 23 saying, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, yes, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil in my cup Run is over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. For your word is true all by itself. We thank you for your power your presence, your promises that you have made us, and that you're faithful to keeping your word. So today we have gathered to give you praise and honor and glory, to worship your name, to exalt you, to, to lift your name on high, to give you the praise that is due to you and you alone. So Father God, thank you. We bless you. We give you honor. We give you glory. You're worthy of all praise. And as we go into your word, as we dig deep down into these words, let them be life to us. For man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. By every word that is written and spoken, we can live. And so we are excited and expected to hear from you through your word. Now Holy Spirit, speak to us. Holy Spirit, make it plain to us. Holy Spirit, speak through me that the people will be blessed by God and not impressed by me. And we ask these, these blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. And every heart said, Amen. Psalm 23. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to thank those for continuing to join us, uh, whether you're by faith, Facebook or, or YouTube, or maybe somebody just sent you this video to encourage you to lift your spirits to give you hope during these trying times I want to encourage you to continue to trust God and, and I know we tell people that and we say well how do you do that how do you trust God well one of the things is you have to be able to realize that that God knows what's best and because he knows what's best, he will do what is best for you. 
He always has your best interest at heart, even when you don't. He is an amazing God. And so I'm starting a new series of messages for this month. And I want you to write this down because uh, writing things down helps it to get into our memory bank so that we can pull, pull it to our, our thoughts when we need it. Uh, the series of messages this year, uh, this, this, this time is Courage in Times of Crisis. Courage in Times of of crisis. You know, October is the month where our fears are, are heightened due to the commercialism of, of Halloween. You know, it's, it's about candy and, and masks, uh, scary and fear and evil and all of those things that people tend to, uh, to, to feel the freedom to express during the month of October. You're starting to ride by and see people's houses are decorated uh, with cobwebs and witches sitting on rooftops and, and tombstones uh, in the yard and all kinds of uh, pumpkins that have been changed into jack-o'-lanterns and weird looking faces and all kinds of darkness and, and evil and vampires and, and just everything now. You're starting to ride by and, and see. It's representative of the fears that linger over our lives, that linger in our minds, the evil that is present in, in this world. I know for many people they say, well, it's all fictitious and it's all make-believe and it's all kind of imaginary, but evil is real. We've witnessed some evil in this world over these past months. I don't think it's by coincidence that many of the climax of, of evil that we've seen is showing up in the month of October. Let me give you a few examples of, of the darkness and the evil that we've seen, the, 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 the dark places that have come to light. We've had some dark places in our political arena. We just witnessed what they're calling one of the most horrific presidential debates ever. That's a dark day, a dark time for us. When the man who is in, in control or in power of these United States is, and, and another man who's trying for that position are battling out like school kids on a playground. That's a dark, that's a dark day for us. I can only imagine what other countries are looking at us and thinking about America. We've had some dark days and dark valleys in our economical world, in, in economics. Listen to this. 837,000 people have applied just last week for unemployment. 837,000 people need assistance to survive from day to day. Can you see the darkness in that? What a, what a dark time for us. What, what an evil time for, for our lives. This is a time of crisis. And in this time of crisis, we see all kinds of dark dark situations. Think about this. The, the darkness that we see with the fear tactics uh, that have been spread about the election that's coming up. How for all of these years the process has worked with mail-in ballots but all of a sudden fear has been shared out through the media to make us think that the process is broken. It's a dark day when we look at health, and we see just in our area, in, in Florida, wherever you may be, that, that 
the deaths for COVID-19 are continuing to rise. Just in the state where I am, over 200,000 people have died because of COVID-19. And I know some people are saying, well, not all of those people died because of COVID. They might have had some other things going on, and, and they're just trying to add those people to the numbers in order to get funding. Listen, if one person dies because of a, a, a lack of response uh, by, the, by the government to protect us, that's one too many. Oh, it's a dark time. It's a dark time when when there's still social injustice, racism seems to be like the race that only, uh, everybody knows how to run. When, when your name is either George Floyd or Breonna Taylor and you face injustice, that is a dark time, a, an evil time, a dark day for us. There's evil throughout this land. We are in crisis mode when people are still looked down upon because of the color of their skin when people are still being mistreated because of their lack of education or lack of finances think about this there are people who are on the verge their homes facing foreclosure, or being evicted. It seems like no one is trying to help. The old adage says that the rich keep getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. We face If the world continues to do this, to act in this way, I wonder what our future is going to be like for our children, our children's children. Wonder what tomorrow is going to be like. You don't know if you, you, you're getting out of your car to go shopping. You don't know if you're going to be shot going in or shot coming out. Story of the lady that just was leaving work down in West Palm Beach and stopped just to get some gas and pick up some items at a convenience store and was killed, shot and killed. These are dark times. We, we are in crisis. I know that people are afraid of of things like vampires and ghosts and goblins, but, but we have things that right happening in our world right now that bring about a sense of fear and crisis in our lives. What are we to do? How does all of this make sense to us? Well, I have good news. And the good news is that in you, by the Spirit of God, the Lord has given you the ability to be courageous. That you must have courage in times of crisis. If I had to have a subtext, a title for this message, it would be, I will not fear. I will not fear. In the midst of all the darkness and the chaos, in the midst of all the confusion, in, in the midst of, of everything that's going on, the unemployment rate, the political banter, the, the, the 837,000 people who have applied for unemployment, in, in the midst of a young lady being killed in her own home because the police did not identify themselves and the police got off free, nothing happened to them. In the midst of over 200,000 people dying from COVID, you have to stand firm and say, I will not fear. The 
takes courage. I want to show us in Psalm 23 about the courage to say that I will, I will not fear. Courage is about bravery. It, it, it's not about the chaos dissipating or leaving us. It's about being able to stand in the midst of chaos. Most people want uh, things to, to go away and most people are looking for uh, things to change but, but you have inside of you what it takes. In 2 Corinthians it says that we have in us treasure. Treasure in jars of clay so that the all-surpassing power of God may be on display. And God has put inside of you what it takes to be courageous. You have to be courageous in your conversation. You still have to say that even though chaos is all around me, God is still in control. You have to have courage in your praise. That you're able to still lift your hands and give God the glory even in the midst of being surrounded by all the evils in this world. Yes, you, you, you must have the courage to hang in there. I know the family doesn't understand and, and, I, and I know that the people on your job are, 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 are getting on your nerves but you, you must have. You have it in you. I see it in you. I know that you have the courage to stand, the courage in the midst of crisis. You've done it before. And I know you can do it again. But it's not in your own strength. This courage, this boldness, this confidence in God, it's what's needed now more than ever before. It's what's needed in the time of crisis. And where, where do we get it from? Where does this, where does this courage come from? I want to take you to Psalm 23. And I want to lift up out of these familiar words. Verse number four. And it says, yes, even though I walk through the valley of the shadows of death, I will not fear. Let, let, let me help us get to this place of being courageous. The first thing that David points out about being courageous is that we must be courageous because of our relationship with God. David, of course you know, was courageous enough to go down and, and battle Goliath and win. But he was able to be victorious, not in his own strength, but because he had a relationship with God. Yes, your courage comes from having a relationship with God. It says in those first couple of verses that the Lord is my shepherd. This is talking about relationship. David saw God as his shepherd. His guide, his protection. The Lord is, not the Lord was, but the Lord is right now. He is our shepherd. He's our covering. He is our leader. He is our provider. He is our sustainer. He is our shepherd. When you know that the Lord is your shepherd and you know that he will take care of you and he has been taking care of you when you realize that you have courage in the time of crisis you won't allow what you hear or what you see 
to cause you to lose focus, you will always proclaim and remember that the Lord is my shepherd. Not, not, not the president of the United States. Not, not, not the former vice president. Not, not the people on my job. Not, not, not my, my co-workers. Not, not my family. But the Lord is my shepherd. Having that relationship gives you courage. Jesus went a little further in John 10, 10, and he called himself, he says, I am the good shepherd. See, the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. That's the kind of relationship that we have with him. That's the kind of relationship that he has with us. We are his sheep. I, I like the way that David says this because when he, he clarifies the, the Lord's role and he clarifies his role, he says the Lord, the all-powerful one, he is the shepherd. He's the one in control and I'm just a sheep. I'm following him. Wherever he leads, I will follow. I got the courage to follow him. Most of us want to follow him uh, when things are going well. But I'm here to tell you that, do you have, ask you, do you have the courage to follow him even in times of crisis? Oh, yes, you do. It's down in you. Yes, you, you have the courage deep down on the inside to take that step and follow, follow him. It's about relationship. See, if you don't have a relationship with him, you, you're missing out on an opportunity to be courageous. To stand boldly and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd, David says. He makes it personal. He doesn't say the Lord is ours. He doesn't say the Lord is their shepherd. He makes it personal. Meaning that this is a personal walk. This is a personal relationship. This is not based on grandmama's religion or, 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 or your mom's relationship with the church or your dad's or your uncle. You must have your own personal relationship with him. People in the Bible who were courageous and done courageous things and, and, and courageous feats and, and won battles was because they had their own personal relationship. Do you have a personal relationship? with the shepherd. One that can last uh, whether you're inside a building or you're worshiping at home. I'm not sad to say that there are some people because they haven't been to church, they haven't been to the church building, that their relationship has become a little shaky. But the Lord is there with you. While you're going through these trying times, while crisis is all around us, the shepherd is not shaken by what's going on. Nothing catches the shepherd by surprise. Not, not our shepherd. He knows everything. He's all knowing. He's all powerful. He's everywhere at the same time. Do you have a relationship with him? And in that relationship, do you know your place? As a shepherd, he, he tells the sheep what to do, where to go. He guides them. Not the other way around. We, we as the sheep, we don't tell the shepherd what to do. We have to get the mindset of thy will be done. Not my will. I'm, I'm just a sheep. But you, you Lord, you are my shepherd. Relationship. I can be courageous in the time of crisis. And I can say I will not fear because of my relationship. His relationship with me. I know a lot of us say, I love the Lord, I, I love the Lord, I, you know, we, we're good at saying that. Oh, I, yes, I love the Lord. But look, can I just share something with you? It is important for us to love the Lord. But what's more important is that the Lord loves us. Think about it.
about that for a moment. How much the shepherd loves you. You can stand and say, I will not fear because I'm in relationship with the, with the shepherd who, who loves me. Let me move on. I, I, I will not fear, not just because of the relationship, but I will not fear because of resources. Listen to what David says. David is confident in saying that the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. What is David saying there? David is saying based on the relationship that, that I have with the shepherd, I don't have to want for anything. He will supply all of my needs. He gives us the resources to make it through each and every day. In Matthew it says, give us this day our daily bread. He gives us what we need to make it every single day. You, you, you can't deny the fact that you've made it through this crisis or you're making it through this crisis not because of your own doing, but because God has supplied everything that you need. Yes, the, the, the resource may not have come when you wanted it to. Or maybe it didn't come from the person you thought it was going to come from. But can't you see how the Lord has strategically moved things around, even in the midst of chaos, to make sure that you are okay? Listen, I just need about five people right here that will lift your hands in your house and say, Lord, thank you for the blessings, for the resources that you've given me even in chaos. Yet yeah, even in confusion, even with, the, with all that's going on in this world, you have made sure that I've been taken care of. Hallelujah. I, you haven't missed any meals. You, you, your lights are still on. And if they got cut off, they back on now because you're watching me on some kind of electronic device. I'm not saying you wouldn't have some troubles to pass through, but look at how the Lord has supplied. And I'm here to tell you that just because he doesn't answer when you call him doesn't mean that he is not, has not taken care of the situation. And one no from God doesn't cancel out all of the, the yeses that he's given you over the years. Think back over your life and the many blessings. Think back just a few months ago and the many blessings. Yes, I, I, I know. I know it's chaotic. I know that there's confusion all around us. I know you see all the darkness and all the evil and, and the high numbers of unemployment and the high numbers of deaths and people that are, are losing loved ones each and every day. But I want you to pause for a moment. I want you to recognize that the Lord provides what we need. He is a provider. Jehovah Jireh, he is our provider. And I don't have to, I don't have to want for anything. Let's, let's look at what he provides. David says, he provides green pastures. <laughs> The shepherd knows the good places. He knows what we need when we need it. He provides green, healthy pastures, healthy places for us. You don't have to get resources by hook or crook. You don't have to do anything immoral or illegal. The Lord will supply green pastures full of life, full of vitality, full of vigor. Exactly what you need. See, the sheep, sheep are kind of timid animals. But the Lord says, I will provide green pastures. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. And he provides still water. See, the fast moving water the sheep is unable to get a quick drink because sheep are timid. The, the noise frightens them. Just the, the babbling of the brook moving too quickly. That's how we are. Little noises, little things begin to, to make us afraid. It causes us to fear. But I will 
not fear because the Lord provides everything that I need. I can look back over my life and I can tell you stories upon stories, true stories where the Lord has stepped in right on time and supplied exactly what we need. A friend of mine, a pastor friend of mine, he tells me a story about he was going through something in his life and he, he had a bill to pay and the bill was like $2,506.32. $2,506.32. And he prayed and he said, Lord, I don't even have it. I don't know where I'm going to get it from. He said that he just told the Lord, you, you're my shepherd. And you promised to supply all of my needs. And he said one day he, he was led by the Spirit just to go out to the mailbox. And he said he didn't, he didn't even wasn't expecting anything in the mail. Can I pause right there and just give you a, a, a blessing right here to let you know that the Lord will provide for you even when you're not expecting it. Who am I talking to this morning? Who out there can lift your hands and say, I've been there, Pastor. I've had the Lord open up doors for me that I wasn't expecting. I've had the Lord make ways for me that I wasn't expecting. I've had the Lord to... To bring in resources and I wasn't even expecting it. So as he gets to the mailbox, he opens up, there's one letter. He says it looks like junk mail. He takes it in the house and puts it on the counter. A couple of days pass by. He opens it up and the check that the Lord had provided was exactly the amount that he needed. Are you hearing me? That the Lord will supply your need. Green pastures, still waters. Philip Keller in his book, Shepherd, A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23, he says these things about sheep. He says, sheep don't lie down easily unless there are four conditions that are met. One, because they are afraid, they're timid, they will not lie down unless it's calm. Because they're social animals, they will not lie down if there's friction among the sheep. Thirdly, if they're parasites or flies or anything that's irritating them, they will not lie down. And if sheep are, are anxious about food or hungry, they won't lie down and rest. This is why the Lord supplies all of your resources. He calms us when we should be afraid. He causes us to forgive one another so that we can live among each other. So we can rest. He helps us to make it through troubled time and deal with the devil so that we can lie down and rest. He provides whatever you need so you don't have to be up all night worrying. First Peter chapter 5 tells us to casting all of our cares on him because he cares for us. You, you got to give him your cares. I believe this. And if you give him your cares and he'll give you rest. Don't worry about it. God's got it in control. But you've got to do your part. You've got to be courageous. Sometimes you've got to be courageous in, in your giving. I know this is a tough time to talk about giving. But I'm telling you now that even in the midst of crisis, you've got to have the courage. You guys, I will not fear that I'm going to do my part. I'm going to honor the Lord with my gifts, with my tithes, with my offering. And watch God work it out on your behalf. I've seen him do it. I put forth a challenge a couple of days ago in my leadership meeting. I'm trying to encourage all of all leaders and all pastors, and not, not just in our church, but everywhere that we are, to step out and be courageous and trust God in trying times, in, in these times of crisis. To be courageous enough to still hold fast to what God has commanded us to do by bringing our tithes and offerings into the storehouse. And I told them, I said, listen, if you try God and take him at his word and you follow his plan of giving, if 
the Lord does not stay true to his word and open up the windows of heaven, even in crisis, and pour you out a blessing that you don't have room enough to receive, if that does not happen, you call me and tell me. If you tried it now and you gave it 100% and you trusted him and he does not do it, you call me and tell me and I will resign as pastor of Mount Calvary. My friends, I've been saying that for about 15 years and no one has come back to say that God did not provide. I will not fear because of my relationship, his, his relationship with me, my personal shepherd. I will not fear because he provides the resources. Relationship, resources. Next time, I will not fear because he restores my soul. You know, as we go through these dark days and we hear about all kinds of evil that's taking place. Yeah, it's evil. Racism is evil. This whole, uh, that, that, that the poor are, are, and those who don't have health care are, are, are facing a time where they may not be treated and, 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 and that's evil. We're all brothers and sisters in this, regardless of, of, of where you come from, what language you speak, the color of your skin, I don't care what degree you have, we, we, we're all in this together. And when we see people that are mistreated, especially those of the household of faith, when we as believers see people that are mistreated, it, 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 it causes you to hurt sometimes. You ever been there? You, you ever see somebody hurting and the compassion that you have? It, it reminds me of Jesus when he had been preaching all day and, and, and the people had been following and he looked on the people and the Bible says he had compassion on them and he told them to sit down on the hillside. And he took a, a little boy's lunch with two fish and five cheap little rolls and he fed 5,000 people. He had compassion. He felt what they were feeling. Sometimes as we're going through these dark places and we hear about them on the news or we, or we see them in our own communities or in our own families, our soul aches. Our soul hurts for people. Our soul hurts when we're mistreated. When we stand to do what is right, when we talk about it, name drug through the mud just, just because we try to do what's right. It hurts. It hurts when you're trying to do the best for your family. It seems like nobody appreciates it. It hurts when you're trying to do your best to be a good Christian, a good friend, a good employee. You're trying your best to be a, a good spouse, a good friend. Just trying to be nice to people. Holding the door for people that are coming in and, and they don't even say thank you. It's challenging during this time of crisis, but you, you got to have the courage to say, I will not fear because even though it hurts me, I have a shepherd that I can go to and he will restore me. I talked a lot about a lot of external things, people hurting us, but there are times that we hurt ourselves. Yeah, when we do things that are not pleasing in God's sight, we're not hurting Him only, we're hurting ourselves. When we look at ourselves and talk down about ourselves, we, we, we can be our worst enemy. It hurts our soul. Dark 
places for the soul. Think about this. David had just enjoyed green pastures and still waters. But yet he brings up an account that his soul needs restoring. That lets me know that you could be walking around saying, I'm blessed and highly favored. And yet your soul can be aching. But the shepherd, he restores. He puts it back together. He heals where we're hurting. One of my favorite shows to watch on TV are those, are those uh, shows about restoration. I love seeing how they take old and worn and ruined items and bring them back to life. When they bring them back to life, they are now ready to serve a purpose. And on this journey, you're going to have times where you have to go before the Lord and say, restore me. I'm tired. I'm not tired of it, but I've grown tired in it. Restore me. I've been carrying my family, and I, 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 it's wearing me down. Restore me. As a pastor, I'm talking to my pastor friends out there. You, you've been carrying the ministry. You've been trying your best to make it work. And you become exhausted. You become hurt. You have to go to the Lord and say, restore me. Maybe you're one who's working in the ministry. Maybe you, you, you have the responsibility of helping to feed the homeless. And it seems like everything you try seems like it's not working. It hurts. But you have to go to the shepherd, the Lord, and say, restore me. David did it when, when he sinned against God. He went and he said, Lord, creating me a clean heart. Because if my heart's not right, if my heart is not in it, if I'm not doing it for the right reason to bring you glory, fix me. strength of the time to be trying to do this for, for the appreciation of others. I'm doing this to please you Lord. But in pleasing you I get hurt by man. I get hurt by humans just like me. But I will not fear because you you will restore me. I know there's some of you that as you listen to this, you're welling up with tears to think somebody is hearing my silent cry. Somebody is hearing what I'm going through. It looks good on the outside. I've learned how to pull it all together, but deep down in my heart, I am torn, I'm aching, I'm hurting. My suggestion to you is to go to the shepherd. He will restore you. There, there are things that you can tell him that you can't tell anyone else. There are secrets that you can share with him and he will not tell anyone else. The resources are not as enjoyable unless you become Restored. 
<laughs> you can have all the money in the world, but if, if on the inside you're broken, it doesn't even really matter. And I know some people are saying, oh, if I just had more money, if I had more. Listen, I'm going to tell you something that's better than money. Peace. Peace of mind. Peace to sleep at night. That you don't have to toss and turn and worry. And the peace of knowing that I don't have to fear. Because I, I'm in relationship. The Lord is my shepherd. I will not fear because he provides the resources that I need. I can make it. Because God's going to make sure that he, he, he does his part to take care of me. I just got to manage I got to manage what he gives me better. And I can make it. I don't have to fear because he restores my soul. Relationship, resources, restoration. But he doesn't stop there. I can have courage. I, 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 I can have courage. I don't have to fear because he, he gives me right paths to follow. It says that he leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. You see why I can, I, we can have courage? Because the Lord is going to lead us in the right path. He is our guide to right path. We don't know where to go. We don't know how to get to the destination that he has set. But he has promised to lead us into in the right path, in the right way to go, in the right things to do. He will give you the right path to take even when it doesn't feel right. Uh, I, let, let me say that again. We, have, we must become accustomed to following right paths even when it doesn't feel right. What I'm saying to you is that we as sheep must follow his example of loving and forgiving and showing mercy and kindness to others even when it doesn't feel right. It might not feel right, but it's right according to God's word. He leads us into the right paths. His leadership is unsurpassed. No, no one can lead like the shepherd. And I want to tell you this. That is he's leading you in the right path. That you must follow closely. And there will be times when you think that, Lord, what are you doing? Where are you leading me? How am I going to make it through all of this? There are times when your mind, your flesh will begin to question whether or not God still has a purpose for you in mind. Because this would not be the path that I would take, Lord. This would not be the route that I would go. But it's the right path. When the children of Israel had crossed the Red Sea, they could have taken a short journey to the promised land. But the Lord led them around the long way. And some people said, oh, well, why would he do that? Because it was the right path. It was a path of righteousness. And on that path of righteousness, he worked on them so to prepare them for what he had promised. Who am, who am I talking to? That the Lord is leading you through some path. It doesn't seem right to you. It seems like the long way of getting there. But he's working on you and in you so that you can be prepared to receive what he promised. Lord, prepare me for what you promised. Prepare my mind for what you promised. Lead me through the path of righteousness. Prepare my heart to receive what you promised so that when you give it to me, I don't get so full of myself and forget that you get all the glory. It doesn't look right. But the natural eye doesn't look right. But it is right. God's way is always right. And as a shepherd, if he leads us, we, we must, as sheep, we must follow. It's a choice to follow. It's a choice as sheep to follow. Some, some sheep get off track. I've been there. I've gotten off track. I, I, but, but there's a, a beautiful illustration of this in the, in the scripture when it says that a man had a hundred sheep. 
and won. One straight away. I'm not ashamed to say that I've been that one. Oh, come on, don't leave me out here by myself. I've been that one sheep that has strayed away. But the man left the 99 to go find that one sheep. That's how much the shepherd loves you. That's how much the Lord loves you. That he'll come looking for you. When we get off of the, the right path. When, when, when we get off the path of following him, he'll come and look for you. And when he looks for you, he's always going to find you. There's a little story about a, a shepherd who had a, a little lamb. And the lamb was following in the right path of the shepherd. But every now and then, the, the, the little lamb would wander off. Get on a whole nother path and, and leave the rest of the sheep. And the shepherd, one day he, he's got to teach the lamb a lesson, how to follow. He takes the lamb and he breaks the front legs of the lamb. Yes, I, I know. It, it hurts. But brokenness is a prerequisite for being used by God. I, I, I don't have time to get into that. I'll come back to that later. But he, he breaks the front legs of the little, the little lamb. And, and the lamb is unable to walk. The lamb is unable to keep up with the, with the rest of the sheep. But oh, look at the shepherd. He takes that little lamb. And he takes the lamb with the broken legs. And he drapes the lamb around his shoulders. And he carries the lamb until he's able to heal and walk again. I don't know about you, but there are times when I have experienced so much brokenness that if it had not been for the Lord to pick me up, to love me enough, to carry me the rest of the way, I would not have made it. I wouldn't be here today. I would not have survived if he did not carry me. Thank you, Lord, for carrying me. Thank you for teaching me how to follow. Yes, we all come in as re rebellious sheep. Yes, we all need lessons. Yes, we must go through some brokenness. But never forget that the shepherd will carry you. He'll lead you in the path of righteousness. And when we get off, he'll, he'll help us to get back on track. Why? For his name's sake. What does that mean? It means his reputation is on the line about you. It means that the promises that he made to you, his name is on the line. The name that is above every name. The name that has been given, that has the name of Jesus. Every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. The name that when you call, it makes a difference. The name that when you proclaim it in your prayers, it allows you to have access to the Father. At the name of Jesus. It's for his name's sake. I like to say it like this, it's for our good and his glory. He's leading us into right paths for our good. He, he knows what, what we need. He knows what lies ahead. I will not fear because he's leading the way. He's going the way, he's showing the way, and he's leading the way. And if we just follow him, We'll get to the destination that he promised. He leads us in right paths. Relationship. I, I, I will not fear because of his relationship with me and my relationship with him. I will not fear because he provides the resources. He is my source and everything else that he gives me is a resource. I will not fear because he restores my soul. I will not fear because the right path that he leads me on. I will not fear. You got to make that declaration in your mind. 
You got to be like David. And you got to have courage in times of crisis. You got to have courage because the road gets dark. Listen what David says. David says that I will go through valleys of shadows of death. My next point is, is that the road gets dark on this journey. But, but, but you, you cannot fear, even though the road, the road gets dark. Out of all of the beautiful words in this song, here's a term where it starts talking about valleys, the shadow of death. It gets dark sometimes. The days you find yourself in a valley. Look at what David says. He says, this is a walkthrough. This is not a place to stop. You gotta have the courage to pass through this. You gotta have the courage in times of crisis. You gotta tell yourself that I will not fear, that I, my family is gonna make it through this. My friends are gonna make it through this. My church is gonna make it through this. My enemies, I don't care. I'm praying for my enemies too. That we all are gonna make it through this because we must keep walking. We must keep moving forward. I grew up in a little small town on a, on a street called Field Street, 47th and Field Street. Field Street was this long road and there were no street lights. There was a street light at one end at 47th and the other end at Railway Avenue and, and, and Field Street. But in between, there's no, there, there's no, no street lights. And at night time, boy, it came, it came real dark. And if you were playing on what we would call back street, if you were hanging out on back street and you needed to make it to front street, one of the ways to get there was you had to walk through the darkness on Field Street. Let me tell you something. There were a couple of houses on there, but man, we were we were scared to walk down on, on Field Street. And there were days on Field Street that I I, I, I was caught down at, at the other end and I needed to get home. And I started walking, trying to act calm. I would be afraid. Every little noise that I heard around me began to distract me and make me make me nervous. It, it, it made me think something was in the woods. Somebody gonna come out of these woods and get me. Some kind of strange mythological animal gonna jump out and grab me. I'd be so timid and nervous. There were days that this chubby little boy would take off running down Field Street, just trying to get home. But there's another scenario. There were times when my friends and I would be playing on Back Street and we'd have to walk down Field Street. And as dark as it was, it was the same darkness that, that when I was by myself, but there was something different. Because we were all together. Because I had a friend with me. It, I wasn't as nervous. I, because I had a friend with me, I had a different kind of courage that said, we, we can handle this. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying he, he's telling us that when the road gets dark, when you pass through valleys of the shadow of death, you must remember that you will not have to fear. Why? Because he is with you. And because he's with you, he'll, he'll get you from one end to the other. We used to sing a song that says, Walk with me, Lord. Hold my hand. Guide my feet. Be with me so that I can make it through this crisis. 
I know to you, Field Street didn't seem like a crisis, but it was a crisis to me. But whatever your crisis is right now, whether it's unemployment, he's with you. Whether it's mourning the loss of a loved one, he is with you. Whether it's you've applied for, for unemployment and you don't know if it's going to come to, the Lord is with you. You don't have to be afraid. You've got to remind yourself, I will not fear because the Lord is with me. Thank you, Jesus, for being with me in down my dark roads. Thank you, Jesus, for never leaving me, even though all around me is, has become chaotic and, and it seems like I, I, I lose focus. Thank you, Jesus. You've been with me even through the valley of the shadow of death or what I call when the road gets dark. Do you realize that light shines its brightest in darkness? Notice this, that the shepherd, the Lord himself, he, he didn't get rid of the darkness. He said, I need you to walk through this. I need you to have the kind of courage that you're not afraid that you can walk through this situation in your life. He assured us in Isaiah, he says, when you pass through the fire, it won't burn you because I'm with you. When you pass through the waters and the floods, they will not overtake you. Not because of your degree, not because of your bank account, not because of what your last name is, but because the Lord is with you. You ought to celebrate the fact that even though the darkness has come, even though we've had some dark days of, of social injustice, and we've had dark days of, of political banter, and we have dark days that are trying to cast fear in the voting process, Lord, you are with us. Oh, I'm encouraged. Oh, I'm encouraged that God is with us and he's always going to make sure that we're okay. We just got to keep on walking. About 10 years ago, they had a song called Walk It Out. You got to learn how to walk this thing out. Even when the road gets dark. Because at that darkest moment is when you begin to realize the brightness and brilliance of the presence of God with you. And here's our resolve. Here's what I wanted to get to. David says, based on our relationship, based on the resources, based the fact that the Lord will lead me in right paths. Based on, even though the road gets dark, he's with me. David makes a resolve. And he says, I will not fear. See, that's a choice that you have to make. That's a resolve that you have to have within your heart and with your, in your spirit to say, I will not fear. Though a host of enemies will encamp against me, I, I will not fear. I will not be afraid. Eviction notices are coming out. I'm, I'm, I will not be afraid. I know the Lord will make a way somehow. How do you know it, Pastor? I, I read it in his word and I've lived it in my life. You're not the first person that, that, that has uh, had an eviction notice. You're not the first person that has had a scare with, with an illness. You're not the first person that has experienced uh, family troubles. And God has no respect to persons and because he brought them through, he'll bring you through too. But you got to make this resolve. I will not fear. Come on, say it with me. I will not fear. Come on, say it again. I will not fear. Because the 
shepherd is with me. He's with you. It's personal. He's with you. Let me close this. Tell you the reasons why you can stand in courage and not fear. Oh yeah, David gives some reasons. At the end of this he says, reason number one, I will not fear because you're with me. Reason number two, I will not fear is because your rod and your staff they comfort me. What he's saying is that the rod and the staff that was used by the shepherd, it brought protection from potential predators. And it also brought comfort in knowing that the shepherd will fight my battles. He says, David says, the reasons for my resolve, the reasons that I can say that I will not fear is because, Lord, you are with me. And, Lord, you have promised to protect me. You promised to take care of me. When the enemy comes in like a flood, you promised to raise up a standard. You said when the enemy starts getting close that they'll fall before they get to me. You promised. You, I'm confident by knowing that you, you got my back. That you will protect me. That you're going to look out for me. He did it for almost over two point some million people when they got to the edge of the Red Sea. The Lord opened up the Red Sea and brought them right on across. And as their enemies tried to come, they were drowned in the same waters. The same thing that, they, that the children of Israel passed through, the enemies were drowned in the same waters. God will protect you. I can think of some incidents right now in my life, you, what you call them close calls. <laughs> we all have had some, some close calls. Why did we survive? Why did we make it out? Some didn't make it. And I don't know if I do, but I don't have time to focus on why they did not make it. I just begin to thank God that I did. And he protected, protected me. Sometimes he was protecting me from myself. Oh, thank God that his rod and staff used for guidance and protection. David says, I can, here's the reason for my resolve. Here's the reason that I will not fear. Because Lord, you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You bring me comfort. I find comfort in knowing that you will guide me and you will protect me. I will not fear because you will prepare a table before me. Have mercy, Lord, in the presence of my enemies. The table represents provision and goodness. David is invited to a table to sit down to feast that he didn't even prepare. And the Lord is inviting you to his goodness and his provision. Right in the midst of of the chaos and the crisis and surrounded by your enemies the lord prepares a table and let me tell you what, what what i want you to what i want you to take away from this i want us to focus on the lord's goodness and not on the enemies that are surrounding us hear me hear me clearly i need for us to get back to focusing on the Lord taking care of us, his goodness, him preparing for us, and, 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 and take your eyes off of what the enemy is doing. Now, now listen, I'm, I'm not saying that you're going to sleep on what the enemy's tactics are, but sometimes we are so focused on what the enemy is doing that we miss the blessing that God has given us right in the middle of chaos. 
Even at the table, this is not a time to be fearful. God prepared the table. Focus on him. Look unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. Look unto him. Stop worrying about the enemy. The enemy can't destroy you. That's what the word says. The Lord says, I have you in my hands. But sometimes we are so distracted by the noises. Remember I told you going down Field Street, there were some noises in the woods. Some unseen things in the darkness. Sometimes we get so focused on them but we forget the goodness of the Father. He says he prepares takes care of us in the presence of our enemies. Stay, stay focused. You know, a lot of people get up to testify. They talk more about the devil than they do about the Lord. Oh, you know, the devil, he sure messing with my family. Or the devil sure attacking my body. Or the devil doing it. No, listen. We must be able to focus on the blessing that God prepares even in of the enemies. That's why we don't have to fear. That's what David is saying. My resolve is in this. I don't have to fear because the Lord is always going to make a way. Even when your enemies are surrounding you. David says, my resolve is in the fact I will not fear because you anoint my head with oil and you cause my cup to run it over. You anoint me, you set me aside for your purpose. Set me aside for your use. Set me aside for your service. And when I humble myself and serve you, Lord, my cup, my cup of joy, my cup of peace, my cup of love runs over so that other people become blessed. I will not fear. David says, here's my resolve. I will not fear. I will not fear because, Lord, you are reliable. Listen to what he's, David says. Surely, I, he, he says, I don't even have a doubt about this. Surely, without a doubt, your goodness and your mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Everywhere I go, I have the dynamic duo that's always at my back and always at my beck and call. Yes, they're always with me. Goodness is who he is. He, he gives me his goodness to follow me. And mercy is what he shows me. It's what he does. It's his steadfast loving kindness and support that he gives to us all. Look at what we have with us. No wonder we don't have to fear because we have goodness, his goodness and his mercy following us all the days of our life. You, you can rely on that. Oh yeah, you can take that to the bank, baby. He, he, he gonna make sure that goodness and mercy follow you. Think about this. While you're following him, goodness and mercy are following you. And lastly, residence. He says, the residence where I want to be, I want to dwell in the house of the Lord. He says, I want to enjoy the presence of the Lord forever. Forever meaning in my days here on earth and in the days to come. My brother and my sister, be courageous in times of crisis. Take a vow and say, I will not fear. And here's, here's my reasons why. I'm, I'm, I'm going to give them to you one more time. Reasons that I will not fear. Because of relationship with the shepherd. I will not fear because of the resources he provides. I will not fear because he restores 
my soul. I will not fear because he will lead me down right paths for his name's sake. I will not fear because when the road gets dark, he's going to be with me. I will not fear because I made a resolve in my mind, in my heart, that I will live by. I will not fear. Despite the darkness, despite the shadows, despite the crisis, but despite what looms ahead, made up in my mind, I will not fear. Fear will paralyze you. Fear will keep you stuck. Fear will keep you stuck in your past and you never get to your destination. I will not fear. He also says, I will not fear because my, my reason for, 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 for this resolve is your rod and your staff comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely, surely, the, the, the reliability of God, his faithfulness, surely goodness, his goodness, and his mercy will follow me all the days of my life, will follow you all the days of your life. And then residence, where I want to live. I want to live in his presence. While I'm here on earth, enjoying his presence as he moves through the Holy Spirit here on earth is just a foretaste of the glory that we'll have when we get to heaven. Be courageous in times of crisis. You don't have to fear because the Lord is your shepherd. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the word. May it fall on good ground, take root, and bring forth fruit. There's a lot of darkness and evil things that are happening in our world. Horrific kind of things. Things that are uh, that would cause us to stay up all night and be worried and to be scared and to be afraid to fall in the trap of fear but your word tells us that you're with us and because you are with us we're making a resolve in our spirits that we will not fear but we will trust in the Lord with all of our hearts and lean not to our own understanding. In all our ways, we will acknowledge you. And like a good shepherd, he will direct our paths. Thank you for being with us, even in the dark moments, even when there's the shadow of death, even when we're passing through the valley. For being with us. We love you. We praise you. We adore you. We magnify your name. Amen. I don't know about you, but I want to thank God for being with us. I know what the numbers say. 837,000 people. I want to encourage each one of them. Don't fear. God will come through. Those that are, have watched the, the mud wrestling match, what we call the presidential debate, don't, don't worry. Don't fear. God's going to come through. Those that have been protesting and peaceful protesting and marching just to keep the name of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and so many others whose lives were taken away by, by injustice. Don't fear. Have courage to know that 
and the Lord is with us. For that mother who you're trying your best to manage the kids being out of school and being at home and you're trying to work and you're trying to provide. Or that father who you're looking for a job. You, it's like you can't find one anywhere. Hang in there. Have courage. Keep filling out those applications. Don't fear. That's what the enemy wants you to do. The Lord is with you and he will come through. In the scripture the Lord commands us even during, during what I call haunted times or times of crisis. He commands us to be courageous. And whatever he commands, he will enable us to do. It's already in you. But you got to take that stand to be courageous. I started the message off with, in order to understand and know that you have the ability to be courageous, you must be in a relationship with the shepherd. That's, that's the first thing. And so I want to pause right now just for a moment to tell you about the good shepherd who will never leave you, never forsake you, who will never turn his back on you. And even when times are tough, you'll begin to see the brilliance and brightness of his presence in your situation you got to be in relationship with him. How do you do that? It's real simple. You pray a, a very simple prayer that says, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. I don't understand about all about this shepherd thing. I don't understand about all about the sheep analogy. But what I do understand and know that these are times of crisis and I need you in my life so that I can be courageous courageous for my, my family courageous for my friends courageous for myself I've lived in fear all of my life I've lived in fear so many days but today I I'm asking you to come into my life and be my shepherd. If you pray that prayer, my brother, my sister, welcome to God's family. You are saved. You are one of God's sheep, so to speak. You're his child. And all the things that I mentioned today in the message, he'll do for you. But you got to have courage courage to trust him, the courage to wait on him, the courage to do your part, and the courage to watch God work on your behalf. You also have to have the courage to tell somebody. Tell a friend, tell a neighbor, tell a cousin, tell a co-worker, tell your neighbor that the Lord is my shepherd now and I don't have to fear. I'll be praying for you. I'll be praying with you. And if you reach out to me on Facebook or YouTube or our, our webpage, I'll get back with you and share with you some resources that will help you to continue to grow in this wonderful relationship that you have with the Good Shepherd, who is Jesus Christ, the one who died on Calvary. John says in his writings that Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. We celebrate that today. You can do it anytime, but we do it on the first Sunday. We celebrate that whole sacrifice that the Lord did for us on Calvary. The scripture says that on the night before he died, our Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. 
This represents my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then it says, after supper, he took a cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Today, and every time we do this, we remember his death. We proclaim his resurrection and we await his coming in glory. Thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice that you made for us as the good shepherd. Because as David has written, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. Listen, a lot of good notes today. Please write them down. Put them somewhere that you can go back and study and look over them all week long so that you can be courageous in times of crisis. Remember this. We love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. God bless. Enjoyed our Sunday worship experience. To stay connected, join us at our website at www.mtcalvarystewart.org. Follow us on YouTube at MTC904 and Tuesday Night Live on Periscope. You can also be reached on Facebook at Mount Calvary Baptist Church of Stewart. Hope you enjoyed the service. Thanks again for joining us.